Jingle, jingle. The mind must flower. It's great to learn. Cause knowledge is power. It's schoolhouse rocking. A chip off the block. Of your favorite at schoolhouse. The world's rock. My grandmother came from Russia. A satchel on. Still sticks, our heritage is mixed. So, so any kid, kid could be, be the president. president. You simply melt right. It doesn't matter what your skin, it doesn't matter where you're from or your religion. You jump right into the great American melting pot. Great American melting pot. Ooh, what a stew, red, white, and blue. So this little presentation is about immigration and citizenship. Really, we're getting into American political culture. Who is an American? What it means to be an American? All right. That was one particular story there. So who is an American? Now, this is an activity that we would normally conduct in class. And uh, so what you can just visualize this is I want you to draw a picture of America and next to it, write a definition of American. So really just boom, right off the top of your head. What does America look like and how would you define American? You got it? All right, let's move on. Okay. So according to the American Heritage Dictionary, American can be defined as of or relating to the United States of America, its people, language, or culture. So you might have drawn a picture of the continental United States, right? However, there is a larger definition of America, of or relating to North America, South America, the West Indies, and the Western Hemisphere. Both of those are legitimate definitions, and they speak to different political narratives, different conceptions of who is an American. As a noun, American can be defined as a native or an inhabitant of America, okay? Someone who lives in the Americas, right? Or what we usually hear, the way our general conception, what we understand American to be is an American citizen. Now, sometimes living in the United States, our conception of that term is limited to that second definition. But if you've ever traveled throughout Canada or throughout Mexico, 
those people are very aware that there's two definitions of American. Okay. All right. So citizenship. Now, what I want to point out here is it's not only a prescription of how government ought to treat its residents. So we're talking about rights, that citizens have rights, protections against government. OK, but it's also how those residents ought to act. So we know that not only do citizens have rights, they also have responsibilities and obligations. That's what we talked about in unit one. OK, the difference between citizens and subjects. Now, in this unit, we're going to add to the fact that citizenship itself is a very particular, very precise legal status. All right. So now we do have two competing, conflicting narratives when it comes to who is American. You just saw the one video about the melting pot. Now, the melting pot narrative was straight out of a social order from the 1970s. Right. So a different distribution of wealth, power and status in society. And that was the dominant narrative about who is an American. It focuses on, focuses on a simulation. Okay, that there is something distinctly American that we can point to. There's a belief in the inherent goodness and value of baseball, apple pie, hot dogs, and Chevrolet. That if you're American, you love those things, right? Okay, so one particular thing, that when you come to the United States, when you emigrate or immigrate to the United States, you're going to give up your previous culture, your previous language, and you're going to buy into that one thing that is wholly and uniquely American, that set of values, that set of traditions, that set of beliefs, and you're going to conform to that. Now, that conflicts with a more modern narrative that kind of emerged in the 1990s, late 1980s. But we call it the toss salad narrative. Okay, and you can, kind of, you can just kind of see the difference. If I'm eating a, a soup, the melting pot, right? And you think of it as a soup, and you might even think of it as a blended soup. Every bite tastes the same. Whereas in the toss salad narrative, it's a focus on integration. I'm going to take people from all over the world, and I'm integrating them like this. Okay, my fingers are still separate and distinct, but boom, they can become one, right? Multiculturalism. There's, there's more than one culture that resides in the United States, and that could be considered distinctly American. There is no distinctly American. There's American, and then there's American, and then there's American, right? So in the toss salad approach, people retain their, their what makes them ethnically distinct from other groups, yet they add on to it a belief in the shared values that kind of bring us together and make us uniquely American, okay? All right, so when we talk about citizenship, there's three different ways we can become a citizen of the United States. Two of them have to be our fall into the category we call natural born citizenship. Now, my Latin's a little rusty. I've never taken Latin in my life, so I really don't know, okay? But I think you pronounce this jus soli, okay? In this one, it's the right of the soil, okay? You are considered a natural born citizen if you are born in any of the 50 states or a United States territory. It doesn't matter if your parents are citizens or not. If you're born here, you are considered a natural born citizen by right of the soil. We also have, you know, use sanguinis. Used to say use sanguinis, but I think it's sanguinis. Not positive on that, but that's by right by blood. So you are considered to be born a United States citizen if your parents are United States citizens. That's the simple way to look at it. If you have a parent who is a United States citizen, that citizenship is going to be passed down to you when you are born. It's much more complex than that. There is laws that govern in it. I'll point out one interesting provision in the laws, our national laws, that allow you to be considered a natural born citizen by right of the blood. Okay, so there's the foundling provision. Okay, so the foundling provision works like this. If I was with my family and we were in the boundary waters right there on the border of Canada one year and we were just canoeing around and then I hear some cries from the woods and I go and I find a small child who has obviously been living with wolves, right? And I'm like, hey, small child, how did you get in the middle of these woods? Okay, and like, do you have any parents? And of course, they can't tell me because they were raised by wolves, right? Well, that small child, if from like, if they're like, until they turn 18, if I cannot prove that they weren't born in the United States, that their parents weren't United, uh, United States citizens, that child will be considered a natural born citizen. Interesting provision. So the law is a little bit complex just to kind of point that out. 
but keep it simple for yourselves. All right, so immigration and naturalization. The third way you can become a citizen is through the naturalization process, but some background on the terms that you'll need to know here. So immigrants, citizens are subjects of another country who move to a different country to live and work. That's the definition of immigrant, okay? Now, in the United States, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services is the executive branch agency that implements, that puts into action, that executes federal immigration law. So they're part of the executive branch. They work for the President of the United States implementing our immigration law, okay? Immigrants that follow the rules and procedures established by United States Citizenship and Immigration Services we call them permanent resident visas. They apply for citizenship. They apply for that legal status. Okay. Generally, you might hear, hear a lawful permanent resident is someone who has received a green card. They're eligible to work. They're eligible to apply for U.S. citizenship. They have what we call legal status. Okay. Now, naturalization is the process of you know, acquiring citizenship that you did not have by birth. You probably know some people that have become natural born citizens in that way. Non-immigrants, okay, and this is another group of people that you should be aware of, okay? So many people come to the United States without legal permanent residency. We call those people non-immigrants. And there are several different categories of non-immigrants and sometimes they blend together. So first off, you have asylum seekers. So people that um, are seeking protection or sanctuary here in the United States from political persecution. Usually these are going to be refugees, so individuals that are fleeing the country. So the person is a refugee, and when they get to the United States, they apply for asylum, which is the protection that they're wishing to have. Now, non-permanent visitors, so like you know, ambassadors from other countries, students that are here just studying from other countries, other international representatives or temporary workers, members of the foreign media, exchange students that you might have living in your house, those are non-permanent visitors. And, and then, of course, we have undocumented immigrants. So those people that have avoided United States citizenship and immigration services regulations and rules to try to live here in the United States. All of those three groups of people we would consider non-immigrants. Okay. Now, just a little note on undocumented immigrants. They often obey the laws. They pay taxes. That's kind of like the positive thing. The drawback that people will point to is that they put strain on some state services. So you think education, education is still being provided to undocumented Im immigrants. Healthcare is still being provided to undocumented immigrants. So they put some strains on those services that a state can provide for people. Now the rights of immigrants and non-immigrants. <clears throat> this is an important distinction here. You're probably familiar with the Bill of Rights, okay, the list of protections that you have against government. Now, in the Constitution, we distinguish between the people and citizens. So in the Bill of Rights, it never says these are protections for citizens. So, and because of that, it's protections for people. So we include immigrants, non-immigrants, and citizens in our definition of the people. So the Bill of Rights protects all of those groups from infringements by the national government. So nobody can deny you your freedom of speech regardless of your legal status, regardless of your status as a non-immigrant, an immigrant, or a citizen. Now, the 14th Amendment, as you will learn, extends that protection to, uh, you know, st against state governments. So not the national government and the state governments can't deny you your freedom of speech, your freedom to practice your religion, okay? Those we would consider to be civil liberties, okay? All right, because down here, when we start talking about immigrants and non-immigrants, rights are limited. Those are their civil rights because they're not citizens, right? And citizenship, with citizenship, you get some additional rights, right? So the right to vote. So immigrants cannot, or immigrants, non-immigrants cannot vote in national elections. Some state and local governments allow immigrants to vote. Okay. You also cannot live in the United States permanently without permission if you are not a citizen of the United States. So those rights, those civil rights, are limited. Civil liberties, on the other hand, that top part of the definition here, okay, those protections that are extended to you by the Bill of Rights are not limited. 
today. So just some figures you should be aware of. And this data is a little bit old. At least 40.4 million immigrants and non-immigrants live in the United States. It's 13% of the total population of the United States. And we just did a census. And sometimes there's a little argument there as, should we be counting immigrants and non-immigrants in our census numbers? Okay. 18 million are naturalized citizens. So of that 40.4, 18 million are naturalized citizens. 11 million are legal permanent and temporary residents. Okay, so they might be pursuing the process of becoming citizens, but at least 11 million are in the country illegally. They're then in that non-immigrant group that we call undocumented immigrants. Now, of that 11 million, 52% of that population comes from Mexico. Of the 40.4 million immigrants, 29% are from Mexico and 25% are from South and Southeast Asia. So it's, a, you know, different groups of people moving to the United States over time. Immigration policy. So just a little bit here. This is hashtag law, hashtag duh. Okay, you should recognize that it's Congress that makes the right, uh, immigration law for the nation. Immigration policy is controlled by the Department of Homeland Security. So that is the executive department within the executive branch that implements immigration law. We've already talked about the United States Immigration and Citizenship Services. They accept and process immigration forms. They deal with naturalization, right? ICE, on the other hand, Immigration and Customs Enforcement deals with border security. Okay, so they're, they're like the, the law enforcement officials that would try to... Um, you know, make sure that uh, our undocumented immigrant population, they're responsible for tracking people down and making sure that they're in the United States legally. So they border security and they vet those wishing to enter to make sure that the reasons that they enter align with what law allows. Immigration policy has been heavily influenced by recent events. You're, I'm sure you're well aware of that. So post 9-11, security 11s, uh, security worries, and then uh, they... You know, illegal immigration, the extensive illegal immigration that happens across the Mexican border, all of those events have an impact on the laws that Congress passes. Now, here's kind of a final note on immigration policy, whom to admit. Our law already prevents, okay, felons, drug abusers, the contagious, and the indigent, which would be the poor, from getting that legal status, from getting, get, get from, the status of being called an immigrant from getting a green card, okay, the LPRs. Okay? You cannot become an LPR. You cannot become a legal resident if you have any of those status. The other thing we want to make sure that we understand is that occasionally down here, throughout the history of the United States, there have been intermittent outbreaks of nativism, okay, which is a belief that the American way of life should be vigilantly protected against foreign influence. So a couple things there. You might recognize that nativism aligns with that melting pot theory. First, that there's one particular way of American way of life that's distinct. And then it needs to be preserved. So you have former immigrant groups that now have legal status and have established their roots here in the United States. They don't like to let new people in because they feel like it's going to change that American way of life. And it's something that should be valued and preserved. And nativism is kind of out on the extreme edge. So sometimes you might be talking about, um, you know, the methods that people are willing to use to um, preserve that American male life, way of life might be on the fringes of what we would consider to be allowable. All right. But it's, you know, it's in and of itself. It's a belief that's out there. All right. That's all I have for you today on immigration. And uh, we'll talk to you later.